All right, everyone, I think we're live. Uh, yes, we are. So, uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, welcome. My name is Robert Rodriguez Jr., as most of you know. Um, it's great to have you here tonight again. I'm excited to uh, be talking again with you on uh, photography and everything that's involved. <laughs> and the, tonight we're talking about Lightroom and particularly the local adjustments in Lightroom. Uh, one, of the, my, one of my favorite things to talk about and to use. I enjoy the editing process, particularly when it's coming from a you know, when, it, when it's something that you feel you're being creative with, I think that's the most enjoyable part of it uh, in terms of using the, the software, this incredible software that we have. Before, before I get started, I uh, just want to say first and foremost, thank you to everyone who has donated in the past couple of days. Uh, really, really appreciate that. And uh, it, it makes, uh, brings a lot of joy to me to know that, uh, or at least I'm hopeful that I'm offering something that uh, all of you find uh, worthwhile and beneficial. And I thank you for giving me your time because I know how valuable that is for all of us. So for me, it's always a privilege and an honor to have uh, your attention tonight. Um, as always, uh, in the interface uh, on the website, uh, feel free to leave questions uh, in the little area where the, uh, the icon, there's like a little circle with a person inside of it. Uh, leave the, uh, use that for leaving, sending me questions uh, or any kind of feedback or anything that you want me to address during, uh, during the webinar and I'll try to answer all of them. Uh, sometimes I don't get around through all of them but uh, those of you that know um, I, I may answer, I, I'll answer them in, the, in emails afterwards. So I always try to answer everyone's question even if I don't get them, uh, uh, get to them right here. Uh, someone says echo. There's no, there's no echo here. Uh, so hopefully, um, that's not for everyone. Maybe check uh, your settings on your side, Lorraine. Okay. So to get started, um, first I want to share a couple of things uh, in terms of the tonal adjustments in Lightroom or local adjustments. I'm sorry. Uh, and that is that. Um, it's getting to the point now where um, the tools and the adjustments available in Lightroom um, are, are, are getting to the point where they, they can become a bit overwhelming and certainly a bit, a bit complex, particularly if you've used Lightroom um, since the early days, you know, 10, 12 years ago when, when, uh, when I started with the Lightroom beta. They've slowly been adding lots and lots of beautiful and wonderful features, but it also adds a lot of complexity. Uh, and so... It's important, I think, uh, to, ma to maintain a sense of creative direction when you're using Lightroom because it's easy to sort of get lost in the weeds, as it were, with all the different adjustments that you can make and multiple ways to achieve the same kinds of adjustments. If you don't have kind of a roadmap or sort of a plan of what you want to do with your image, it can become a little bit more difficult. Of course, when you're learning, you can experiment, you can play with stuff and you can't break anything as they say. But, you know, once you really want to, once you, you, you understand the basic concepts of Lightroom, you know, you, you want to feel like you're getting somewhere with your images, like you're actually improving them. Um, and so I want to urge you to try to keep the big picture in mind all the time. Uh, everything that I'm going to share and talk about is stuff that I've learned on my own, but also I've learned working with lots of other students in workshops and online. And I tend to see certain patterns within myself and also in others. And so I know that we're all susceptible to this. Um, but this idea particularly of getting too myopic, so to speak, of getting uh, too zoned in on a specific part of an image, and we forget that the whole picture has to work uh, as a whole. It's what happens in the whole picture that really is what's going to tell your story or help you to share your vision. You know, not how well you've um, edited one part of an image, but it doesn't quite work. You always want to maintain that sense of, of, a, of, of a cohesive nature. Uh, in my composition um, ideas, I share the LCU or the LCH, that last part. Everything has to feel harmonious. So always keep that in mind. What are you trying to say uh, with your image? Now, I want to share some concepts with you. So let me switch to my monitor here. 
And these are just some main concepts that, um, uh, or let, let's call them guiding principles uh, that I think are important uh, to working with local adjustments in particular. The first one is um, you always want to think, I suggest you think working from a global to a local level. So in other words, always start with the entire picture and then uh, and then decide what needs what would you need to work on on a local level. Uh, it's easier to maintain a sense of direction that way. It's easier to maintain this cohesiveness that I mentioned before, and it's easier to kind of keep your uh, creative plan uh, intact uh, that way. The second thing is, which is a bit trickier, I would say, until you get a little more experience, is uh, try not to use a local tool if a global tool, uh, a global adjustment works just as well. Uh, and the reason for that, again, you want to keep things a bit simpler for yourself. If you can achieve something globally, and sometimes you can without going to a local tool, then I would suggest that you choose that option to keep things simpler and easier to manage. And the last uh, kind of guiding principle that I would offer you is um, less is more. Okay, um, As I said before, uh, you want to be, uh, for me, I want to be effective, right? Effective means that I'm sharing something that has some creative vision behind it. I feel like I'm saying I'm sure something. I no, not you, Siri. Sorry. <laughs> um, effective for means that you're saying, you know, you are saying something with your image, uh, that you are conveying what you, uh, what, what you felt, what you saw and felt. And to do that, you want to be intentional and you want to be efficient. So again, this idea, intentionality with all your, with all of, all of your editing will make them more transparent because you're, you're going towards a goal, which is to create the best composition possible. And also you want to be efficient because um, if you're not efficient, again, it's uh, um, a lot easier to sort of lose your way. Okay, so less is more. These are the things that uh, I always try to work on and continue to work on, and I think they'll help you as well. So let's jump into some images. And before I start editing images, because this is, I titled it Mastering the Local Adjustments, and I have to admit upfront that even though uh, I titled this and thought of it as one webinar, uh, the more um, I uh, kind of prepared for the webinar tonight, the more I realized that this is probably going to be a two-parter. It's probably going to be two parts to this. So that'll, there'll be the first part today and then probably a second part next week, just because it is uh, that much uh, information that I want to share, not intricate information, but basic conceptual understanding of how all of the local adjustments work, particularly with the new point color that Lightroom added, um, you know, within the last week or so, which adds, a, which adds another very interesting and unique way to um, edit and uh, affect specific colors, and we'll talk about that today. So let me bring up this image here, <clears throat> and before I work in it, I just want to go through the interface a little bit um, in terms of, particularly with local adjustments. So of course, I'm going to hit D for develop, and I'm going to open my histogram here. All right, so we, you know, we have the 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 familiar UI here on the right hand side of the local adjustments basic tone curve color mixer, etc. And up here, we have um, a couple of different icons here. The first one is basically to go into the edit mode. So if you're in if you're in the local adjustments, clicking on this will bring you back to basic editing, uh, cropping the healing tool or cloning tool, depending on what mode you're in when you're in that tool, uh, the red eye correction tool, which uh, for our purposes here, we won't be using. And then the local adjustments. Now, when I click on, it's called masking. It used to be called local adjustments. I have to get used to the new terminology that Lightroom is using more and more, the masking tool. Okay, when we click on the masking tool, uh, essentially, we have this different ways of creating a mask. And a mask is uh, how we select a portion of an image. So when, you, when you're doing global adjustments, uh, in this area here, okay, there's no mask involved because 
everything that we adjust here is affecting the entire image. When we go into the masking uh, area, which is what I've called the local adjustments, we have different ways of creating masks. And uh, uh, Lightroom has added a few new ways to create masks up here in the last year or two, which are uh, more automatic driven or AI driven, such as select selecting uh, automatically selecting a subject, selecting sky and selecting the background. And then we have our usual sort of manual masks, um, uh, objects, which is also AI driven. Then we have a brush, the brush that's been there from the beginning, a linear gradient uh, and a radial gradient. And then we have uh, um, what they call range, which we can either use a color range or a luminosity range or luminance range. Color range means we're selecting by a range of colors luminosity by a range of tones, luminance, uh, you know, from for anywhere from black to white. Uh, and then there's another section here for people, but again, we won't have, I don't have any people images in these particular images and pictures that I have for tonight. Perhaps next week I'll bring a picture with a person in it or two, and then we can, <clears throat> I can uh, <clears throat> experiment with that a little bit. Now, so this is how we select uh, these tools here are for set, uh, uh, the type of mask that we want to use. And each mask, each mask type has its strengths and weaknesses. So obviously uh, a brush is going to be the most sort of freeform type of creating a mask. If I click on brush here, uh, you can see that I get this circle with uh, two circles. The inside circle is where the effect is going to be applied completely. So. <clears throat> Let me just create a, a setting here. So something like that. And the outer circle defines the feathering. So the distance between the two circles is the feathering, meaning the, uh, the fading of the effect from the full effect to no effect. Now, each mask has its own controls. So when I select the brush at the very top here, underneath the uh, mask area here where the masks are identified. This is also fairly new to Lightroom where we have a list here of the different masks that we create. Regardless of what kind of mask they are, we'll get a, 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 a list there, kind of like layers, if you're familiar with the layers in Photoshop. Um, below that, you'll see options for uh, the, the mask type that we've chosen. In this case, I've chosen a brush, and so we have size, we have feather, flow and density. And we also have an option to select two kinds of brushes in this case, so A and then B. And I tend to have the A brush uh, set as a brush with ha which has 100% feather, so it's very soft on the edges, okay? And then the B brush, which you just click on it by selecting B, it's like a different brush. Um, you can change the settings, but I usually have that one set with no feather, so I get a very hard edge on the um, on the brush and sometimes that's useful and sometimes it isn't most of the time i want some kind of feathering to make the effect uh the mask look as smooth as possible so size and feather and by the way size can be adjusted with the left and right bracket keys so i do that fairly often you can hear that now uh, i go back to the a brush again it changes the size of the brush but not the size of the feather the feather stays the same in this case 100 meaning it's a maximum amount of feathering that you can have on the brush. Now, flow and density are basically two controls that, two, two settings that affect how the uh, mask is applied. I'm gonna go up here and delete this brush, and then I'll create a new one so I can show you the flow and density. Uh, so, Flow is basically the opacity of the brush. So if I have it set at 100%, I'll get 100% of the effect. If I drop the flow to 50, then it's 50%. And if I brush over it, I'm brushing on another 50% and another 50%. And so you can keep adding strokes over the original one to get it up to the maximum of 100% or the whatever setting I have here, which is an exposure of one of positive one stop. And I'll get to the controls in a moment. The density setting is a cap. You can think of it as a 
cap on the total flow that you'll get out of this brush. Okay, so if I have a flow of uh, 25, okay, so that means that every stroke is 25% of the effect, and I lower the density to 50, it means that no matter how many times I go over that same stroke over and over and over again, it will not exceed my density, which is 50. So the density is basically a way to uh, cap the amount of uh, of the 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 mask uh, uh, so that you don't exceed that amount. I, I rarely use the density setting. I pretty much always keep it at 100, and uh, I just use the kind of the flow to determine how much or how little I want uh, the mask applied. But um, the density again that that's that's what it does in case you find it useful you can use it I can imagine if I were using the same mask here so I'm applying it at hundred percent and I wanted to apply it over here but I definitely didn't want it to go over 50 then I could drop the density to 50 and here see it wouldn't go past 50 percent hundred percent here 50 percent here okay so that's what the density does okay so that's um, the at least the, the settings for the brush tool. And the brush tool tends to have the most number of settings, the radial, uh, the radial gradient and the linear gradient, uh, a little bit less in terms of the number of settings that they have. Now with every mask that you create, you have a certain number uh, or, or certain, certain types of controls, adjustments that can be made with that mask. And this is where it gets extremely interesting, but also uh, somewhat <laughs> complex. So I'm just going to minimize my histogram here so we have a little more room. So below the settings for my brush, here we get to all of the adjustments. Okay, all of the adjustments that can be done uh, to this mask or, or with this mask. And so we have, uh, we have tone, okay, uh, things like exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. We have color, uh, and color is basically a temperature adjustment, making it warmer or cooler, a tint adjustment, which makes it more magenta or more green. We even have a hue adjustment, which is a little bit of a refined version of the temperature, uh, and it tends to keep it more, uh, it doesn't darken or lighten it, but just kind of changes the overall tint, kind of. We have an overall saturation, and then we have the newly introduced point color, which I'll talk about later. This one is very powerful. Then we have a curve. Uh, so this is uh, tonal adjustments, uh, adjusting contrast. You can adjust uh, shadows, midtones, and highlights on this curve. Same type of adjustments that you can make with the global adjustment tonal curve. And we also have effects, things like texture clarity and dehaze, even grain, and then we even have detail. Detail is a kind of a simplified version here of the uh, uh, detail that we have in the global settings where we actually have things like masking and radius and things like that. Here we don't have so much of those uh, 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 adjustments. We basically just have a sharpness, noise, mori, and defringe. But nonetheless, that's a lot of different types of adjustments that you can make to each mask. So th this mask that I applied here, uh, which is just kind of a random, you know, thing with the brush, uh, I'm, you know, I'm using tone here, but I can certainly, you know, I can use contrast there. So increasing or decreasing contrast, pulling down highlights, shadows, whites, and everything else down here. So you can see how uh, between the different kinds of masks, that are available now, and all the, the variety of controls that we have for them. Um, it, it's extremely powerful, but also can be a bit, um, it can get unwieldy if you're not, you know, really paying attention to what is it that I'm trying to achieve. Okay, so I hope that um, that clears a few things up here in terms of the interface. Another thing that I like to do at times is the, I, I'm going to call it the layers panel or the masks panel, uh, where you have a listing of all the different masks that you use. You can sort of unlock this 
uh, from the right panel here and sort of float it around in case you want to have this by itself. Sometimes I do this when I just want to see the masks that I'm working with uh, and have a little bit of more room to scroll here through all the different effects that are available to me. Okay, and then to, uh, you know, to put it back, uh, you can just drag it anywhere in this panel and it'll snap back in at the top here. Okay, and then as I use uh, other uh, features or, you know, as I use other parts of the interface here, I'll, I'll mention those. I'll mention what I'm doing and, 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 uh, and where it's found so you know. So, for example, every mask that you add, as I said, gets, uh, you know, a, a list here. And these three little dots allow you to uh, access different options for the mask. So, for example, you can rename it. You can invert it. Uh, you can duplicate it, you can hide it, you can intersect the mask with another mask, which I will talk about uh, that at some point, either today or next week. And you can also delete this mask or you can delete all masks. Okay, so we can delete mask one. Now that mask is gone. And uh, so that gives you a nice way to kind of manage your mask. I do recommend that you name your masks. Uh, this way, when you go back to the image in the future, especially when you go back to it in the future, like if it's a few weeks later, you remember what you were working on and what you were doing with that mask because it's easy, to, again, to forget and to kind of um, get lost in, in terms of, boy, I have five or six masks here. I'm not really sure what I was doing with those or what they apply to. You can figure it out, but if you name it, it just makes it a bit easier. Okay. Now, before I get into the masks themselves. Um, I know a lot of you want to know about the new point color, which is the new option uh, feature that was added. And before I use it as a mask, I'm going to use it in the global settings first, because this is kind of a bit easier for me to show it to you there, I think. And then uh, the same, you know, it's, it's identical in the global settings as it is in the masks in the local adjustments. And, and once I show it to you in the global settings, then when we use it in a mask, um, it'll be a, a, a bit more easier, I think, to understand. So with this image here, what I would like to do is um, I want to obviously uh, give it a bit more life, all right, give it some more uh, depth, but particularly I want to try to see if I can separate the orange uh, leaves from the yellow leaves. There's some orange leaves here, some here, they kind of wrap around this way. There's some in the background here and then the yellow leaves are in the front and there's some even some green leaves there. And I'd like a little bit more control to separate them out more because to me, when I made this image, they didn't seem so um, interwoven the way they look in the picture. They definitely looked more separated to me uh, in real life or at least when I was there. Uh, and I want to create a little bit more of that sense of separation and depth between the yellows and the oranges. Because uh, in this image, I only have those two colors, the orange, the yellow, there's a little bit of blue in the back in terms of the fog and then the dark trees. Um, I can probably achieve what I want to achieve with global adjustment. So this is an example where Sure, I could probably use some kind of a local adjustment, but the global adjustment will work just fine because uh, it won't compromise the image anywhere else. So let me just make some basic adjustments to this image. Uh, going to increase the exposure a little bit. I think it was a little bit dark. Um, I'm gonna leave the whites where they are for now. I'm gonna drop my blacks, holding down the Option or Alt key maybe around there for now. I'll bring up some of the shadows. Um, pull down some of the highlights a little bit. Oh, there we go. All right, then I'll add some texture. So in this image particularly, I don't wanna add much clarity. The reason for that is because when you add clarity, you tend to pull in things that are in the background. 
Uh, in other words, clarity is mid-tone contrast, and that'll, that'll work nice. That'll be fine for the leaves and the trees in the foreground, but I want to leave the stuff that's in the background kind of diffuse and in the back. And if you add a lot of clarity, it tends to add a certain um, uh, uh, sort of a contrasty look to everything, and I don't want that. So I'll show you what that means by that. See, if I add clarity here, it tends to pull the background in, and I want to leave the background the way it is, kind of softer in the background. Texture um, is the perfect remedy for that, if you will, because it will add more definition to the leaves in the foreground, but it kind of leaves the background uh, more the way it looks without the texture. So it doesn't affect the background quite as much. And I'll add a little bit of dehaze. Okay, and I think I'm pretty good there for now. <clears throat> now, one local adjustment, I'm going to start with this one first, that I would like to add is um, I'd like to keep the viewer's attention kind of moving in the middle. And to me, it feels as though on the top left-hand corner of the image here, it gets a bit brighter. It tends to get brighter as we go up to the top left-hand side. And of course, it gets very bright in the top left there. I want to try to... Uh, see if I can balance it out a little bit. So the way I'm going to do that is by using a linear gradient. It's one of my favorite masks. I use it constantly. So what is a linear gradient? So I'm going to go up here, click on the masking tool, and linear gradient is right here. Basically you click on it and then you get this plus sign. You click and drag. And when you click and drag, you basically pull out these three lines. And the beauty of the linear gradient uh, is, is that it creates a really nice transition. That's, that's the, the one super powerful thing of the linear gradient is that it creates nice gradations from the effect up here to no effect here. So uh, this is the center point of the linear gradient this line here defines where the effect is 100%. So because I drag down, you can see the mask is red up here. So everything, the, whatever effect I apply, it's going to be 100% until we get to this line, the first line. And then from here, it starts to slowly gradate uh, from 100% until we get to the midline, which is 50%. And then we get to the uh, bottom line, or the, the top line, whichever whichever way you want to look at it, which is 0%. And so the effect is 0% here, and it slowly adds the effect until we get to 100% here. Everything above there is going to get the effect 100%. So it, it's a very, very nice way to create a very um, gradual effect along a straight line. And so here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag it out about to about here to make that very nice and subtle. And, uh, and then I'm going to lower the con control I'm going to use is exposure. I'm going to lower the exposure a little bit like that. Actually, maybe less exposure and more highlights. There we go. So the combination of exposure and highlights. Okay, and the adjustments that you make with the uh, masks, just like the adjustments you make in the global setting, in the global adjustments, is something that you know, you, you'll have to get familiar with and experiment with and learn what's best but because I started with the idea of I want to try to lower the tonality a little bit kind of like a vignette but just in that left hand corner uh, a, a linear uh, uh, gradient seemed uh, the best to me and if you know if it wasn't because I was explaining this I would you know I could I can do that in 10 seconds basically just add that linear gradient add a little bit of minus exposure minus, minus highlights and I get more or less the effect that I want Okay, so that looks better. Um, the next thing I'm going to do now is let's get into the point color adjustment. So uh, I'm going to close down my uh, masking area. I'm going to hit close to come out of the masking and go back into the local adjustments. And then down here, they've renamed, Lightroom has renamed the HSL controls. They've renamed it to Color Mixer. And when you open up Color Mixer, we have the uh, what used to be called HSL is called Mixer now, all right. But we have uh, the the familiar HSL controls, hue, saturation, luminosity for uh, 
you know, whatever it is, eight colors, and then we have point color. Now, the reason they added point color, uh, or I suspect one of the reasons is because with the traditional HSL controls, what they now call the mixer, uh, the eight colors are predefined. So you cannot adjust the colors that they predefined for you. So you have red, orange, yellow, green, aqua, blue, purple, and magenta. Those eight colors, you can't change those colors. You can certainly use the target adjustment to see if whatever you're selecting is a combination of red and orange and in different amounts, which is very powerful, but you can't actually select the specific color that's in your picture. You can only select a color that's closest to red or closest to orange. All right. So in this case, we do have orange and yellow. And you can see if I went to luminosity and I drag the yellow up and down, you can see that I do brighten up the yellows and I do uh, darken the yellows. The, the, the difficulty with this potentially is that green also has yellow in it. Now, we do have a green slider here. And so you can see that we can adjust the greens as well. And so that helps. This picture is one where the colors that Lightroom specifies are kind of in the picture um, automatically, which is nice. And then here we have orange, okay? So it does give you a lot of control, uh, the, the mixer adjustments with this particular image. But it's not always the case that you have an image where you have you know, colors that are so clearly aligned with the preset colors in Lightroom. Sometimes you have colors that aren't amongst these eight colors, in which case that's where the point color adjustment is going to, the point color um, uh, tool is going to be much better. But I'm going to use a point color anyway because I think it'll be nice to, to use with this image. So I'm going to hold down the optional Alt key and just hit Reset Saturation. And what else did I adjust here? Luminosity, Reset Luminosity. Okay, let's come over to Point Color. So Point Color now uh, basically allows you to use the eyedropper, okay, to sample the color that you want to, uh, you want to edit. And so in this case, I come and, and you have to sample the color because it's not predefining it for you the way the color mixer is. You can choose the color you want to work that you want to work with. So I'm going to select yellow here, and you can see that it adds yellow as my first color. You can add more colors, but it adds yellow as the first color or that particular yellow that I clicked on. Okay, and then immediately below uh, the the yellow chip here and it shows here the yellow, the color that I selected, I've got my adjustments. Okay, so I can adjust the, the hue, I can adjust the saturation, I can adjust the luminosity. So these are the actual adjustments. So you can see that I can lower or raise the luminosity of that particular color that I clicked on. I can adjust saturation and hue. Now the range adjustment below that allows you to uh, sort of refine the range uh, of the color that you clicked on. So you can expand the range to include a bit more yellows, right? Yellows that are closer to the yellow that you clicked on, or you can limit the range to limit it more specifically to the exact color that we clicked on. So in this case, if I raise the luminosity, Okay, you can see that when I raise the luminosity, I'm also raising some of the luminosity of the oranges here, here, and here. And I don't want to touch the oranges. I just want to raise the luminosity of the yellows. So my range, as it is right now, is too big. I have too big of a range. It's including colors that are sort of going into the yellows. So the first adjustment here that we can do is we can lower the range so that it's just yellows, okay? It's still picking up some of the oranges here so I can lower the range a bit more, but it doesn't seem to be working, okay? So the next step is if, if the general range adjustment doesn't work, then we can get into the fine tuning of the color that I selected down here. And you, we have three different ways to fine tune the color that we want uh, to work with. We can fine tune it by hue, by saturation, or by luminosity. So in this case, I'm going to, I mean, we can try all three, but my guess is that uh, it's not the luminosity range that's the problem because the oranges and yellows are very similar in luminosity, how bright they are. 
uh, and not necessarily the saturation, it's probably the hue. We're including too much of the oranges in the hue that we want to use. So if you see here hue, uh, in the hue uh, uh, area here, you have this rectangle and the rectangle selects the, uh, whether we have more colors around yellow or less colors around yellow. So this extends into the green, less into the green. This extends into the orange, less into the orange. So I'm going to, just so that we can see the effect better, I'm going to exaggerate the luminosity shift. So let me go like something like that. I'll raise it up a lot. Okay. So you can see when I drag this out, we get more of the oranges included in the, in the, in the effect that I'm adding, which is luminosity. And when I drag it this way, we get less of the oranges. These oranges here and down here don't get affected as much when I minimize the, lumin the range, but when I extend them out, they get included. So I want less of the oranges. Now we can drag the left or the right, or we can drag this whole uh, rectangle left and right. Okay, and then these outer rectangle uh, triangles with the line over them, these define the transition, the fade, how smooth uh, we go, or how smooth Lightroom uh, selects from the colors that are included within this rectangle to no selection at all. So similar to the feathering in, with, the, with the brush tool or the, the other local adjustments, it's kind of a feathering. And so again, we can bring this in to kind of uh, be more precise about selecting yellow. And I'm going to come this way to select less green. Now you can see that we're really starting to hone in mostly on the yellows and much less if if any at all on the oranges maybe a little bit back here uh, but we're going to lower these we're going to uh, lower the luminosity in these oranges in the next step so that'll help as well to separate those out and maybe bring the luminance range in a little bit at least the feathering to keep it to the brighter yellows And now I'll bring this luminosity down a little bit, so make it more natural, okay? So the, every um, panel in Lightroom has this little eyeball here. If we click on that, that's without it, and that's with it, with, with the current effect that we've added, the point color effect. That's without it, and that's with it, all right? So I'm gonna add a little bit more. Now, within the same effect, we can add uh, another color. So we did the yellows, now I want to work on the oranges. I want to see if I can make the oranges a little darker, and I'm hoping that by darkening the oranges, we'll be able to separate them out a bit more. So I'm going to select the eyedropper again, and I'll come up here, maybe somewhere around here where this is a nice uh, clear orange. So now I've got my second color chip, and notice if I click on the first color chip, which is the yellow we can see the adjustments that I made to yellow. If I click on orange, now we have controls for orange and whatever we do with the orange. And so here I said that I was going to reduce the luminosity a little bit, maybe increase a little bit of saturation. And again, if I want to reduce the range, maybe to isolate it more to just orange, and this is a coarse adjustment, this range adjustment. It doesn't really work that great. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but in this case, I don't see, see, I'm not really affecting yellow, the yellows all that much. I'm really affecting the oranges. And if I want to make sure that I'm not affecting the yellows, I can again come to the hue here, and I definitely want more of or uh, orange and less of yellow. So I can drag this whole rectangle to the left, maybe, pull on the transition on the, uh, the fade here the transition so that again I'm making a more abrupt change from orange to yellow and not really touching the yellows so that's before and that's after before and after so I'm going to maybe not make those oranges so dark maybe a little more saturation so that's before and that's after Okay, so I think we've got a little more separation 
uh, between these oranges here. And the yellows, as in terms of what I was looking for. Okay, so let's look at our before and our after. I'm going to come back to the orange, back to the yellow. I'm going to lower that a little bit. I think it's a little bit too bright. Okay, we'll stop there. And then the the last thing that we can do here is I would like to uh, uh, lighten a little bit. I would like to lighten a little bit these dark trees here. Okay, they're a little bit too dark for me. I want them to be a little bit soft, a little bit more subdued. And so the easiest way to do that would be to create a another type of mask based on luminosity. So I'm going to come back up here to mask and I'm going to click on create new mask. Now, why luminosity? So why am I selecting this mask? Well, what I'd like again, what I'd like to do is to lighten and maybe cool off some of these uh, th these trees and they're all very very dark, at least the darkest ones. As they get more into the background they become a little more uh, fainter and that, those I don't mind but it's really the ones here in the front that I'm looking at I can mask them in with a brush but that's going to be a bit difficult because I have to get around all these leaves a bit sloppy um, but what's the what's the one thing about those tree trunks that s makes them stand out from everything else is that they are the darkest thing in the picture and that's where a luminance mask comes uh, comes in handy because a luminance mask allows us to choose a mask, a, a part of the image based on luminosity. So click on create new mask. I'll come here and click luminance range. And when I click on luminance range, the controls for luminance range, okay, you can see here uh, before when I made a, a brush, we had all the different settings for the brush here. This is all we have for the luminance range, which is, again, this familiar rectangle uh, where we can drag the rectangle left and right. And this, everything inside this rectangle defines the tonal range that we want to select. And then the little uh, triangles here on the right and the left hand side define the fade, the transition from the full effect to no effect. Okay. Now you can drag it around. That's one way to do it. And because I want darks, I can pull this down to darks, something like that. And you can see now that the mass that it's creating, the red, you can see that as I pull this down further and further, limiting the range just to my very darkest darks, the mask is reducing more and more and more just to those trees. Notice that it's not touching the background. It's certainly not, not affecting any of the leaves. It's really on the darkest parts of the image which is the tree and then I can turn down the transition and by doing that I limit it even more to these trees so that's that's one way to do it another way to do it is um, if you hover over the image when you have uh, when you when you've created this mask you can also click on uh, and drag a part of the image to define the luminosity range that you want the mask to uh, uh, to read and so I can click and drag a square over the tree here and you can see that it almost made the identical uh, adjustment that I had made manually I'm just going to make the transition a little bit more abrupt okay so that's the mask now what I want to do I want to raise the exposure in this a little bit And maybe I want to, about there, maybe point almost a half step. And then maybe I want to cool this off a little bit with color temperature. So that the trees are a little bit more neutral color wise, letting the oranges and the yellows come out a little bit more. And also, um, I want wanted to raise the uh, lighten them a tiny bit so that they're not so dark now I why didn't I use uh, shadows I didn't use shadows because when you use shadows um, it tends to 
uh, just increased shadows, but it leaves the darkest darks alone. And I really wanted to just kind of make them a little bit less dark overall. Um, I can always go back uh, and adjust my black point to make it a little bit darker. And the other thing I want to do now that I'm looking at the image is I'm going to close and come out of my masking, go back to my global adjustments, the basic panel, uh, I'll adjust my blacks again, something like that. And I'm pretty happy with the color temperature. And I think I'm okay there. So that's the before and that's the after. Okay, so for me, again, just making the giving the image a little bit more life, uh, separating the oranges from the uh, the yellows from the oranges and showing you with a simple picture like this um, the, uh, the point what the basic features of the point color control now the point color control is also available in the masking uh, tools so that we'll, we'll I'll show you that next okay so here's another image um, Again, I've chosen these images because uh, they have lots of colors in them, and so they they allow us, they allow me to kind of demonstrate uh, the use of the masking adjustments and point color, particularly with images where it's kind of easy to see the colors. And then as we get into more uh, images that are uh, more you know more natural landscape images, in particular where the colors tend to blend in more, we'll have a better feel for how to use these adjustments and masks to get the most out of the pictures and make them look more natural. But in this case, what I'd like to do here um, is, uh, what I want to do here is I want to, I'd like to bring out the umbrellas, particularly the color of the umbrellas to make them a lot richer and more vibrant and maybe push back a little bit the architecture, the buildings, uh, particularly the one that's sunlit here. Uh, and if I, you know, uh, this I made this picture many, many years ago, I believe in Italy, but I recall that the umbrellas were definitely sort of like the thing that was catching my attention, and I left the building there in the background as kind of a backdrop to add some context. But when I look at the raw file, uh, it's almost as if the umbrellas are not um, uh, as rich and vibrant as they can be, Particular, particularly these up in the sky. I, I kind of want these to really jump out at you so that your eye kind of flows through and picks up all these different colors. And it's just kind of a fun image where, I, again, I can demonstrate some of the point color adjustments. So let's do basic adjustments first. Uh, exposure's fine. Uh, maybe leave highlights alone. Let's check our whites. So I'll stop there. Check blacks. Stop there. Um, a little bit of shadows, some some clarity. This is an image where clarity is definitely beneficial because it is going to give us mid-tone contrast and that's precisely what we want here and everything to give it a nice more presence, a little more edge if you will. Um, I'll add some a little bit more vibrance, just a tad here. Okay, so there's our before, and there's our after, just with some basic adjustments. Okay, so far, so good. Um, maybe I'll add some more, I'll add some contrast as well. Okay, so for me, that's about all I can do with the global adjustments. In this case, there are so many different parts of the picture, very specific areas, uh, specific shapes and objects that the global adjustments are going to affect everything. So I thought it was fun to kind of see how I could perhaps use the masking features to adjust different areas and maybe you'll pick something up here um, if, you, if, you, you know, if you're not familiar with something. 
So the first thing I'd like to do is figure out how to select this building because I would like to tone the building down a little bit, maybe just to bring the luminosity down so it's not so bright and that'll allow us to um, then work with the foreground. Now I could certainly mask it in, um, you know, using a mask and I can go around and select everything very, very carefully. Um, and that would definitely work. But I want to show you, uh, at least what I discovered using point color, how we can kind of achieve the same thing. So we do have to make a mask. So first thing I'm going to do is, we do have to make a mask with a brush is what I meant. So I'm going to select the brush because we, in order to apply the point color, we have to select the area that we want to apply it to. Remember, once we create a mask, the point color will only affect the colors within that mask. So unlike when we use the point color in the global adjustments where they affect, for example, if we choose yellow, it'll affect the yellows throughout the picture. I only want to affect the colors within a specific mask. So we create a mask around the building as best we can, and then we use point color to target a specific color inside the mask. Okay. So, and I don't want, I don't need to use a feather because the, the point color is going to do the work for us, not specifically the mask. So I'm going to click on B here to select my brush that doesn't have a feather. And I'm just going to come up like this. Basically, I want this mask to cover the entire building because we want to work within this area. We want, basically this mask is saying that we want point color in the local adjustments to only operate within this mask. Now there's our mask. So obviously if I use something like exposure, right, it's very coarse and doesn't work for the building. However, if we come down to point color in the uh, in this particular mask, and then I can click on the eyedropper and I can select uh, a color in the building here. Let's say that. Okay. Now, when we make adjustments to this color, like luminosity, okay, we can adjust the brightness and darkness of that building and we can change the range to make it bigger or smaller. So I'm going to make the range a lot bigger. And you can see here that I'm actually lowering the luminosity of the building by itself. And that's because the point color adjustment is saying just use that yellow that's included in this building. And if I need to select other colors, for example, this darker orange color here, I can select the eyedropper again. We come over here. And now you see that it's a little bit darker. And same thing here. I can use the luminosity shift to lower that down. And back to this yellow, the first color that we selected, I'm going to increase the range of that color so that we pick up more of those yellows. Again, even though the mask went over this uh, magenta-ish umbrella, we're not using, we're not, there's, there's nothing in the colors that we've chosen that even comes close to magenta. And so the effect that the point color is applying is going to ignore the magenta just like it's going to ignore the blue because we are limiting it to these two colors and furthermore we're limiting it based on these uh, uh, parameters down here which is basically the luminance range the saturation range and the hue range and i'm i'm at this at this moment i was with that yellow selected i was adjusting the hue range and the luminosity range as well. We want to pick up darker parts of that, you know, darker uh, areas that have that color. Same thing with this here. Now, one very cool shortcut or one very cool tip that you can use with point color is if I select uh, one of the color chips and I come down here to the bottom and I click on visualize range, what it does is that, what it, what it will do is that uh, within this 
uh, mask that I added, it'll turn everything that's not being selected into black and white. And you can see that it's picking up a little bit of that umbrella there. So maybe that's because I didn't uh, add the skin. The mask. That's, okay. so that, that's the reason, because I, I didn't mask that in. So now you can really see that it's ignoring the umbrella completely. And it's picking up only uh, the yellows here. Okay, everything that it's not affecting is basically gray. So the umbrella is turned gray, this part of the umbrella is turned gray, and you see the sky has also turned gray inside of the mask, telling us that uh, anything that's in color is being affected, and anything that's not in color is not being affected. And I'll, I'll use that visualized range a few other times so you can see um, how that works. Okay, uh, and so then I'm going to click on the orange chip. And once again, I want to increase the range of that. And you can see I can darken that or brighten that. And I'll come back down here, uncheck visualize range, and you see how we have darkened the building. So now we can, um, to see the overall, overall effects of point color, I can come up here to uh, the mask, hide the mask, turn it back on. That's without it, and that's with it. Okay, now let's do a few more with the same technique. So instead of having to surgically select this umbrella, which I certainly could, but for the purposes of showing you what the point mask is doing, I'm going to create a new mask be brush and I'm just going to create a mask you notice that my mask is spilling over into the sky but because that's be, uh, that's okay because the point color adjustment will target the yellow so once again with this mask selected I come down to point color select the eyedropper click on that yellow and now I can raise the luminosity Raise the saturation a bit. I will, I'm pretty happy with that. I'll do it again. So we'll create a new mask and I will, uh, sorry, let me do that again, brush. Okay, I'll choose this umbrella. Select the eyedropper and click somewhere in this umbrella to select its, its color. So somewhere around here, that green. And then again, raise the luminosity. Now, I'm sure you see that it's selecting a little bit of the sky. Okay, so our color selection isn't as refined as it needs to be because we're picking up some of the sky. So that's where this, we can try this range adjustment first. Lower that down. And you see once I lower the range adjustment, meaning that I'm limiting the color that I selected to be closer to that color and not so spread out where it's going to pick up the sky, we now have a nice uh, selection of that color without affecting the sky at all. Okay. Let's create another mask here, brush. We will select now our uh, okay, there we go. Um, why am I not creating a brush here? Hmm. All right, let's see, something is wrong here. Let's try that again, so brush. Uh, let's try this green umbrella. No, it's not creating a mask. So let's see, why is that happening? Let me come out of that. Okay, so I just came out of the masking tool. Let's go back in again. And Okay. Low intensity size, so I'm not getting a mask. 
very strange. Okay, so it's not making any new masks. That's odd. All right, let's try this. Let me go out of that picture. Sorry, folks. Technical difficulties. We'll go back in again. Okay. Okay, so that's interesting because all my adjustments, I believe, are uh, lost, right? So notice all the adjustments I made, none of them are here. I'll try the history panel and we'll go to that stage, okay. So I went into the history panel and I went back to where we were. So now let's see if creating a new mask works. Uh, no, it is not working. Okay. That is very strange. Uh, maybe try object instead of brush. Sure. Um, We'll try object at this point. Let's see what happens. So if I put a circle around this, it should select that umbrella. It is not. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, as they say, um, I'll restart Lightroom. So if you guys can hold on for one second. Start this again. Okay, let's try this one more time. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Alrighty. All right. So I've selected this umbrella here. I'm going to come over to point color, select that green. We've got that green selected and now I can adjust the luminosity. And I'm going to make another mask. We'll do one more. I think you guys got, uh, understand what I'm doing here. Brush. We'll select this umbrella, come to point color, click there, luminosity. Now you see that it's spilling over into the sky a little bit. And you can see here that the major difference between the umbrella and the sky is probably one of uh, hue and saturate, uh, hue and luminosity. So I can come down here to the um, the refine tools here and perhaps we come away from that blue including the feathering and we can also reduce the luminance range so we want to select dark and see that already that did it you see so by moving this uh, this rectangle more towards the left what I'm saying is select uh, a blue select the blue that's a bit darker darker ranges of that blue versus lighter ranges and darker ranges of the blue are in the umbrella not part of the sky and then the feathering allows you to again adjust the transition in this case we can use a fairly abrupt transition because there's a very hard edge between the umbrella and the sky there'll be other examples later where we'll see landscape images or nature images where the transition is not as smooth and so uh, not as abrupt and so we can be a little smoother um, with uh, with the uh, with the adjustment okay and so let's look at now what we've done that's um, that's the before and after okay before on the left after on the right let's make one more adjustment I'm going to create a new mask and this time I want to select the sky okay 
There is an auto sky select now called select sky. I usually start with that one first. So let's see what it does in this case. And that actually did a pretty good job. You can see it selected the sky even with all those things in the sky. It's selected around the umbrellas and around the building. Okay, and now I can go to effects and I want to pull down highlights. Maybe a little bit of exposure. Something like that. Okay, so that gives you a general idea, I hope, of the using point color together with a mask to select specific colors and being able to adjust those colors in terms of their luminosity, how bright or dark that color is, the saturation of the color, and the um, hue of the color. So just to give an example of that, if I came back to this mask here, so this mask here is for that uh, blue umbrella here, right there. Okay, if I come back to point color, I made it brighter because that's what I wanted to do. I can also desaturate it or saturate it. Notice when I saturated it, it started to pick up a little bit of the sky again. Again, I'm not going to saturate it all that much, but if I did, I can come back here and readjust the ranges so that it's only selecting the umbrella. And then I can also adjust the hue so I can make it uh, less purplish or more purplish. And again, I was happy with where it was. I really just wanted to give it some more life. I wanted to make it a bit brighter. Then I'm going to show you one more adjustment and then we'll move on to the next image. I think we can do one more image tonight and then we're done. Um, let's say I wanted to darken the building in the background, this building here just to give, make it the background make it a little bit darker so the umbrellas come out more. Well, again, I could use point color in the global adjustments, but there may be some colors in here that may also be found in other places in the image and it might get a little bit, uh, uh, you know, sloppy, if you will. What I could do though is, because it's darker, and I will, would also like to make an adjustment that has a gradient to it, and that's a hint, then I'm going to use a radial grad a linear gradient. And I'm going to drag up from the bottom this time, like that. And I'll close this up. So remember I said before, um, when you the direction that you drag from is the direction where the effect is going to be applied. Of course, you can always you know, turn the gradient around if you don't get it right the first time. It's happened to me many, it's happened to me many times. And then the effect is going to be applied 100% in this area, and then it's going to, I'm going to drag this out more. I think I want a more a gradual effect, but we'll see what it looks like. And then I want it to slowly transition to no effect. Okay. Now, I want to limit this filter. Right now, it's a, a, it's, it is uh, basically going to adjust everything um, in this area. So if I were to come up to exposure and darken this, you see it darkens um, it darkens everything, okay? Or lightens everything, but in this case I want darken, but I don't want that. I only want to darken the darkest areas. So what I can come, what I can do is I can come up to this mask and I can refine it, I can, I can sub, uh, subtract from this mask uh, a luminance range. So I want to subtract everything that's above a certain brightness. And by clicking on this umbrella, and I just chose one umbrella, but they all tend to be the same kind of brightness. What I'm saying now is I'm modifying this linear gradient by saying only select luminance values that are in this range. And this range is um, the highlights. So in other words, I'm subtracting this luminance range from the mask. Meaning that when you look at the mask now, the red overlay is going around all the umbrellas and I can make this luminance range bigger or smaller. 
Okay, so the bigger I make it, the more of the umbrellas is going to pick up. The smaller I make it, the fewer the umbrellas. Okay, now I can use the exposure to just darken the building a little bit, leaving the umbrellas alone. Okay, so again, I applied a radial, a linear gradient, and then I subtracted from that linear gradient everything that was in a high luminance range or a bright luminance range and more or less that that is everything that is sunlit right and I, I also used a linear gradient because you notice that it gets darker as we go down towards the edge and that seems more natural because as we go down further into this area of the picture here where there is no light you would think that the shadows would get stronger and it wouldn't be as bright as it is above the buildings or towards the top of the buildings. Okay, so that's that's the overall effect. Okay, so again, you can add and subtract to any uh, mask. You can add and subtract with a brush, but you can also add and subtract with any other um, of the types of masks that you can create. And again, I will show this, I will show this in other, in other examples. Let's see, uh, okay, so let's, let's, I think we have time for one more quick image. Okay, and some of you said uh, you were creating masks by visualize mask is off. Perhaps, yes, perhaps that was what I was doing and I couldn't, I didn't quite see it at the time, but luckily I got that working, but thanks for that. Okay, so what I want to do in this picture is I want a kind of a dramatic image. I want the trees in the foreground to really stand out. I want to get, have a nice sense of grounding with the foreground here. And then I want those clouds, those beautiful clouds that are just billowing up and building up into those oranges to kind of cover and give something that we can rise up to from these strong vertical shapes into these beautiful horizontal shapes. That's the idea. And I also would like to create a bit more separation between the uh, the kind of the grayish clouds with the orange and kind of the blue of the sky so that we really have a lot of depth to the image. I'm not uh, going into all of the uh, global adjustments uh, like sharpening and things like that because again, we're talking about local adjustments. So I think I've probably left the sharpening on. I'm just gonna show you the basic adjustments that I do. Um, and actually, that's where we should be starting. Okay, that was the final version, so let me go back to the start version. All right, so that's the original image. And I gave it away, but we'll see how we get there. <laughs> okay, so... Um, so first I'm going to, uh, let's see, adjust my whites. Exposure, I'm happy with the exposure. I'm gonna stop there for the whites for now. I don't wanna go too far with the whites yet until I adjust the sky because I know that I'm gonna add a mask to the sky. Adjust the blacks. Definitely open up some of the shadows so we can see some of those rocks in the foreground. Pull down the highlights. I also want to cool the image off a little bit. All right, and that gives us that separation that I mentioned before. So as shot, or as it, as it was uh, by my camera, it was at 5100. I tend, this particular camera, I tend to always leave it on um, 5100 as a default. It doesn't do an auto white balance just because it keeps consistency on all the images that I make. It doesn't change the white balance for me automatically. But uh, the downside to that is that I don't, I often don't get the uh, white temperature, uh, white balance that I think the image should have. And for me, you notice when I cool the image off, we get a lot more of that separation that I mentioned before. Uh, the the cool the warmth in the clouds the cooling of the sky that really separates them out and for me that's very very important you know no downside we're working with raw so no downside to having your, your camera set to whatever it is you can always adjust it in Lightroom that's the beauty of raw files and, able, and being able to adjust white balance 
I'll add some vibrance. Uh, I'm going to add some uh, clarity for sure. Um, I'll leave texture alone and even a little, uh, a little bit of dehaze, I think, as well. Let's try a little bit of that. So I'm looking for, again, more definition in the clouds. Okay, more of the sense of the, the, the grandeur of the clouds and this, this kind of beautiful uh, night with beautiful sunlight. Pull the highlights down a little bit more. Okay, so I think I'm oh I think I'm happy there. Now what I would like to do here is I'm generally happy with the image. I would like to do two things. I would like to um, maybe adjust a little bit of the foreground with a mask, and also I'd like to bring out a little bit more of the oranges, the warmth in the clouds. I want to leave the gray part of the clouds the way they are, but I want the oranges to be a bit more dramatic because to my eye and particularly to the, the feel that I got from the clouds that night, they definitely were richer in color. I'm not seeing that color here. So for that, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go to my uh, mask. I'm going to add a new mask and I'm going to make this sky. Okay, now sometimes when you make this auto mask, particularly when you have trees in the foreground, it won't really go around all the trees as well as you would like it to. So one little uh, thing that you can try, one little tip that I picked up is you can invert any mask. And so if I go to this mask here, and in fact, let's call this main sky mask so let's name our mask if you come up here to these three dots you can click on invert sky when you click on invert sky now uh, it is selecting everything that is in sky okay and one thing you can try it doesn't always work a hundred percent but i have had luck with this is now that we've inverted it we can come again to these three dots and you can select, actually, I'm sorry, we can say subtract, okay? Like in the previous image where we subtracted dark tones from that, uh, light tones, I'm sorry, we subtracted light tones from that mass so that the umbrellas weren't chosen. Here we're gonna subtract from this, uh, from this mask that's been inverted to select the everything but the sky but we're going to say subtract sky okay and when we do that it'll subtract um, the sky from this mask and you can see that it actually did a little bit better of a job of cutting around these trees not so much down here but definitely around here so i'm going to undo that okay and i'll zoom in so you can see this a bit better Okay, so you can see that this tree here, these trees on top here, the mask isn't that great. If I go here to subtract, select sky, okay, and you see it cleans, cleans them up pretty well. Not down here, but certainly from here up, the mask is a lot better. And now we can simply go back to this sky mask and invert it again. So now we've got what we really want, which is a better mask for the sky particularly cutting around these trees. I don't need them to go all the way down here because our effects are really going to be targeted up here. Okay, so now that this mask is selected, I can go to my tone controls. Maybe I'll bring down highlights a little bit more, maybe a little bit exposure. Uh, I can also come down here to effects. Again, we're working within the local adjustments within the masking panel. And I can add some more clarity now to get a little more definition in those clouds. And then what I want is I want a little more, uh, more strength in the orange. Now, 
before the point color tool, this was pretty difficult to do because you could either do it with color temperature, but that would change the temperature of everything in the sky, or you could do it with the global color mix of the HSL. But if you had other things in the picture that were orange, then you would have a problem. But now with point color, uh, in selectable within the sky mask, I can select the eyedropper, I'll come over here and select uh, the best representation that I can see of that orange. And then I, again, to show you the visualized range, if I click on the visualized range, everything should turn black and white in the sky except for the color that we've selected. Okay, and you can see now within the sky mask, because that's what we're working inside of, everything that isn't the orange selected should turn black and white. And it, it, in fact, that's what it did. So we know that we're selecting, that's how you know that you're getting all the, the, the color that you want. Now, I didn't get all of the oranges that I want. There are some darker oranges, particularly back here, the kind of purplish orange. But of course, remember that we can always select multiple colors to work within this point color control mask or this, this, uh, th within this mask. So I'm going to add some saturation about there. And then I'm going to grab the eyedropper, click up here somewhere in this darker part of the cloud that still has some warmth to it. And once again, I'm going to add a little bit of saturation. And maybe I'm going to come back to this first one and maybe adjust the luminosity to make it a little bit darker. Okay. When I come back up to the mask here, if I click on the eyedropper that hides that mask and that shows it. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with that. I'm happy with the way that looks. Um, The other adjustment I will make now is to some of the foreground here to give it a little bit more interest, just a tiny bit more interest versus being so flat. So I'm going to create a new mask and this will be a brush. And whenever I'm doing dodging and burning, as many of you guys have seen, I like to use a, a brush that has a feather. So I'm going to use my regular A brush, not the B brush that has no feather. And again, you can customize these whichever way you want. It's always going to remember the last brush that you used. So I typically have them set up as, as I said before, A with a, uh, with the full feathering. And typically for this, I'm just using exposure. So I'm going to adjust my exposure to about 0.30 and maybe just add to some of these rocks in the foreground. That one in particular there was pretty nice because it seems to be catching light up from the sky. Maybe here, maybe a little bit here, and right there, okay? And then I'm going to create a, another mask. And this one will be dodging or burning. I'm sorry, burning, darkening, and lower the exposure on this. And I'm just, I'm setting the exposure before I apply it because I personally like to see the effect, not the red mask. <laughs> you know, I want to see what it's doing to the image right away and kind of get feedback from that. So here, again, just carefully, I will go around and darken a few spots here that are in shadow, already in shadow. This rock in particular, um, down here, And actually, I'm going to undo that one because I think I applied the dodging there before, maybe down at the bottom here. Okay. So that's that mask, just in a few areas. Notice that I'm not very precise. I'm not surgically precise. Okay. There is a feathering on it. So I'm not trying to select or darken like the exact shape of the rock. 
it's more of a it's kind of a suggestive kind of natural look that I'm always after so that you don't really see the effect you just know that the light is slowly bending and fading and wrapping around these rocks particularly when we don't have direct sunlight which means that the light is already really very soft all right and so here I can maybe lower that a little bit more that's better um, and then to the other mask and I should be follow my own advice and call this burning and this mask here dodging and this dodging mask maybe I will raise the exposure a little bit to exaggerate that effect there we go So let's see here. That's the before and the. So that's the before and the after. I will probably go into the after image and maybe now I will add a little bit more contrast now. And in fact, sometimes I get the effect that I want with the global contrast. Uh, and sometimes I prefer to use the tone curve. In this case, I'm going to go with the tone curve because I, I find that that gives me a little bit more definition when I want contrast. I can apply points to do the typical S curve or sometimes I would just use the medium, con medium contrast preset. And that always tends, well, not always, but it, you know, often it gives me the effect I'm looking for. And I think that's what I was missing when I looked at the before and after. Um, it didn't have that presence that I was looking for. So you notice that my effects aren't dramatic. They weren't crazy, right? But there definitely is a difference, a big difference between the two pictures. There's more depth, I think, to the after. The oranges are more alive. Uh, the, the, it just feels more dimensional to me, particularly the foreground and um, the sky where I can just taking the picture uh, and, and you want your uh, you want to try to make your effects your editing as transparent as possible um, I think that's the key for me is you want them transparent but effective right you want them to be powerful you want them to um, to to just show the the potential of your vision in the image if it if it becomes about your editing then if you can see that then um, you know, perhaps your, 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 your story is not going to be seen <laughs> as well as you would like it to be seen. All right, guys, so I think that does it for tonight. Um, hopefully that was helpful and um, instructive. As I said, I was sure that this is going to be a two-parter. There's a few more images that I wanted to get around to uh, that I didn't get to that I think will show uh, some more uses, creative uses of the masking, local adjustments, and particularly the point color. Um, but we'll leave those for next week. So next week, same time, I will send an email out and, um, and uh, we can continue. If there aren't any questions, um, how do you change black and whites in basic adjustment? Um, well, in the basic adjustments, uh, black and white is right here in the tone area, whites and blacks. And if you just click and drag on the whites and blacks, you'll see the effect. But if you click and hold down the option or the, the option key on the Mac or the Alt key on the PC, you get this overlay. And then as I push up to the right, you'll see anything that's blowing out will turn white and same thing with black okay so the key there is holding down the option or the alt key on whichever computer you're on okay so thanks everyone and uh, if there are any other questions if anything comes to mind send me an email um, i will send a link for to watch a replay i will also be posting the all the webinars from now on in the uh in the creative path community forum you can watch them there and that'll also give you an opportunity to 
leave questions there and we can have a discussion about whatever I've shown and you can talk to others about it and maybe share some tips that I'm not aware of. That would be fantastic. All right. So again, thanks everyone. Appreciate it. And uh, see you next time. Have a good night.